Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, or if you're borrowing one of our guest Bibles, we're going to be taking a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 today. We're going to be taking a look just a little earlier than that. Our passages, uh, two let us passages, are from 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 and 5, 8. But we're going to start earlier at chapter 4 and verse 13 and take a look at that whole section in the context of it. This is our 11th sermon in this series, <clears throat> counting the ones that we did with Hebrews. And uh, today is Let Us Keep Alert. We're talking about the second coming of Christ as he wants to encourage the church that, um, that meets that we have the letters 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Last week, we had an Olympic image in the call of Let Us Keep Going. Let us keep going so that we live up to what we have already attained. And that is live up to what we have already attained in Jesus. This week, the text is about the return of Jesus and the reminder to let us be alert. He also says let us be self-controlled. The idea is let us be prepared for his return. <clears throat> are you expecting company? Is that what you look like when you are expecting company? How many people have had company this summer? Look at that. Wedler counts. You can put your hand up. Have you ever had company come over that you forgot about? Oh, yeah, they're coming tonight. <laughs> oh, that was then. Or company coming that you thought you had the time, but you weren't home when they actually got there. Or company that just kind of walked in and that caught you unprepared. Stretch. Yeah, that could happen. Here's the point with that. Jesus is coming back. Amen. He's coming back. He's given us some warning that he's coming back. He's the company that we're expecting. And so instead of hurrying up and trying to be prepared, we just stay prepared. You're ready at any time. He wants us to be ready, alert, and expecting his arrival. What we're going to point out in that is he hasn't told us when. Here's the next two words. On purpose. Not that he couldn't if the father told him when, but he's left that to be the surprise. I'm coming and that's all that you need to know. But when I'm coming or how all of this is going to happen or all the other specific questions, here's what you need to know. I'm coming. So that is the call to be ready. We know that Jesus will return again because he tells us so. There are aspects of his return that are unclear, including exactly when he'll return and how much notice we'll get. These questions about the end times and the removal of the physical are grouped together in a type of study called eschatology. Remember that from Wednesday class? Our Wednesday class has opened that can of worms. We've waded into some pretty interesting passages, some interesting ideas, some perceptions on the topic. We've looked at ideas that have a little more value or less value than others. But we're not the only ones that have asked these types of questions about the end of time, the end of life, the return of Jesus. When is everything physical going to go? Is all that's just spiritual going to be left? What's going to happen in this transition? God had Paul write two letters to the church in Thessalonica, which is a Greek port city in the Aegean Sea, which you can still go and visit today. You can go to that city or at least the near region of where it was. But he writes this because of these ideas. The problem is within the congregation is that they were really struggling with the idea that Jesus' return was not as they had expected. He was a part of their, you know, near history, his 33 years, and he died, and he was supposed to just come back. Well, they're getting older, and some of them have started to die. So what? Now what's going to happen? 
The people of the area had specific concerns that related to the questions about the return of Jesus and if Jesus would only take those that were living. If you had died, had you missed your opportunity? They were concerned that those that had died had now had no hope. No hope of heaven. No hope of resurrection. So God encourages them with teachings about the return of Jesus and teachings about the end of time. Do you need help with understanding the return of Jesus? Is that a topic that it's, uh, it's pretty muddy, it can be confusing? Is that something that you wish you had more of a handle on to say what does it say or what does it not say? Do you have people in your life that struggle with this concept and the questions around it? Do you think Jesus' return, the end of everything physical, our physical transformation, our transformation from these bodies into bodies that are like Jesus, the idea that this is a seed that will be changed, the idea of the final judgment, knowing that when Jesus comes, people aren't going to be able to say, oh, now I believe. And at the judgment, you can't just change sides because you know better now. Here's the thing about all of this. A word that Alvin used in the welcome. Do you find all of this, and what's that word? Encouraging. When you think about the end of time, when you think of the final judgment, when you think of the transformation, are those thoughts primarily thoughts of encouragement? Or is it concern or confusion? Or what word would you put with the idea that everything is going to end and we're all going to be judged? Everybody you know, everybody that has ever lived is going to be affected by this. Do we find within the church discussion of eschatology encouraging? And do we encourage one another with these conversations? To get the context, to build up to the let us part, we're going to go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Because again, these weren't written in chapters and verses. The concepts all flow together. The context of the let us really goes back to starting with this verse. And he says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. This is a major reason for writing to them. Brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant. That's one thing. I want to talk about this. I want us to think about it because, first of all, I don't want you to be ignorant. Because that ignorance can lead to confusion, unfaithfulness. It can lead to all kinds of other areas. It can lead to asking other people other questions and getting different answers. But I don't want you to be ignorant about this. And the other thing is, he doesn't say, I don't want you to grieve, does he? But your grief is going to be different because you have hope. So then in the, the next verse, starting at 14, what he wants them to hold on to as they think about, as they concern themselves, as they encourage themselves with questions about life, death, burial, resurrection, eternity, and judgment, all of those concepts together, he reminds them of what they do know, right? Even if you don't know how all of that goes, here's what you do know. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Amen? Do you believe that? A little bit, or do you really believe that? We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so, what's the other part of it? Was it just for him? No. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Isn't that a good image? They're not gone forever. They have fallen asleep. And they will wake up. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now why that is, I don't know. 
Not necessarily. It, God could have done it the other way around. He says, we will not precede those who have already fallen asleep. In verse 16, Here's kind of the flow chart of events. Because this is what they want to know. What's going to happen at the second coming? For the Lord himself, see that's different than angels? The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Anybody going to miss that? Is that going to be pretty noticeable? Did you notice that he didn't say he's going to send a million angels to go and tell people next week I'm coming? What's the first event? The Lord himself will come down and heaven itself is opened. The archangel, the trumpets, the announcement made. It's not I am coming, it is here I am. And at that point, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Which is going to be something because we live pretty close to the cemetery. So if we happen to be alive, our family will be walking over there because I want to see it happen. I know a number of people we planted over there. That's the New Guinea word. I want to see them rise. Won't that be amazing? Won't that be encouraging? Hi, bud. <laughs> Good to see you. You know? Roy, Pearl, we know a number of people that are over there. That what's left is over there. It'll be good to just see them. And they're going to rise up. After that. It doesn't talk a lot about how that's going to happen. But after that, verse 17. We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The idea of dual resurrection or some before others just doesn't really fit. Doesn't fit at all in Thessalonians. And so we will be with the Lord. What's the last one? Forever. It's done. This isn't a trial period. The resurrection is the resurrection and we will, the dead in Christ first, then those who are alive will meet them, and it all happens at once, and that's it. It's done. We'll be with the Lord forever. And then we get verse 18. If these things are true, since these things are true, therefore, encourage each other with these words. Not reprimand, not guilt, not manipulate, all of this is, he's coming, stay ready. It's an encouragement. Because there's not going to be a lot of time to get things right when it happens. In the passage, we have a sequence of events that will end with being with the Lord forever. And the command, the encouragement to us, is to encourage each other. Not just individual encouragement, but to find others that this message is encouraging to. Encourage each other with these words. So what about the time frame? What about when he's coming? Well, we get to chapter 5 and verse 1. And it makes it very clear, very plain. Mark your calendar on this date. Here's when it's going to happen. Or does it? What he makes clear is that you can't mark your calendar because I'm not telling you. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, brothers, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. Because you already know? Because I already put it on the calendar? No. Verse 2. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Here's what you have been told. I'm not telling you. That's it. I'm coming again, and I'll come when I come. Well, people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. He starts with the negative. Not those that are faithful. We've already talked about those. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those of us that are faithful will be ri rise up with them. But he also has to mention what about those that are not right with the Lord. It'll come quickly. And destruction will come upon them suddenly. And they will not escape. The time of Jesus' return is to be a mystery. 
Matthew chapter 24, 36 through 51 points out, same thing, as Matthew records Jesus talking about when he returns and how that will be. Matthew chapter 25, we have three parables in a row talking about the impact of the truth in 24. He talks about the ten virgins. Some were ready and some were not. Remember that section? They didn't have time. They couldn't share their oil. Either you were ready or you were not. Then we have the parable of the talents. The master comes back and what does he expect? Return on investment. That's the principle of that one. I gave you, doesn't matter if I gave you one or two or five, I expect a return on investment. And the last one in the section of Matthew 25 is the separation of the sheep and goats. I use that as an illustration of his people will help others and they will do good in his name. And when you help other people, when you do good to others, it's like being good to Jesus. He expects us to be active in goodness. In this section, by this point, we know that his return will be a surprise on purpose and some people will not be ready. Now we get to our lettuce passage and we come to them in contrast to those that are not ready for Jesus' return because he expects, he encourages the group to be ready, just like when we read it, we encourage one another to be ready as well. But you brothers are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. This is live a separated life. Ta-da! You can mix, but you better separate. You don't live like that. You don't belong to those things. You don't connect there. Now we have the let us. Let us. See, let us, the reason we're doing all of these, the reason we're looking at these passages, they're not a command. It's not let you or let me. It's not individual action, but an encouragement to the family of believers to share with one another. We begin with the negative and we move to the positive. So then, let us not be like others. What's their identifying trait? Let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. How well do those words describe your faith? Is your faith, is your kingdom work, is your participation in the church, is it alive? Is it active? Is it beneficial? How do you space, stay spiritually alert and self-controlled? And who do you encourage to stay the same way? Who do you connect with in ways to encourage alertness and spiritual self-control? And who helps you in these ways? See, the passage is a let us. It's not as long as you're okay with God, that's fine. It's a let us. We need to take responsibility together. The reminder is to stay in the light. He says that in other passages. Why do you stay in the light? Because there's no shame or guilt. It can't claim us. This is where we can live above reproach, as he calls elders to. The light and the darkness. Those who are asleep and those who are awake. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Remember, in some environments, we do not mix. Other people stay alert through the night, don't they? If that's your job, you better. If you went to the emergency room like 1 o'clock in the morning, would you expect the lights to be off? Well, we're all sleeping. It's, we just shut it down. Some people can stay alert in the night, can't they? Some people you expect to stay alert through the night. I don't know why they expect pizza people or people that work at A&W to do it. They serve 24 hours, but for whatever reason, but there are necessary things that are open 24 hours. God expects us, our faith, to always be alert. We're on call, always. But since we belong to the day, 
That's an identifier. We don't belong to the night. Others belong to the night, therefore their faith is dead, they sleep. But we belong to the day. Let us be self-controlled. Adds that in. What does it take to stay alert? Self-control. It takes focus. It takes perspective. It takes discipline to stay self-controlled. Which is what we'll be talking about Wednesday at class. The image kind of builds when we get to the second half of the verse. It says, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. This is akin to the full armor of Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, but it's just the minimal, right? Breastplate, helmet. I think this, to me, this is an imagery of a sentry, a sentry that's been called to stay work, awake on the tower overlooking the city, but not necessarily for fear that they're going to be attacked, but waiting and waiting and waiting for the sign of victory. All that he needs is his breastplate and his, his helmet in case something does come, but it's a sentry that's standing there waiting for the news that the victory has been done and there's no threat from the enemy anymore. So how do we stay self-controlled? Well, we're just awaiting the sign of the victory. And that's worth staying awake for, isn't it? So why do we live this way? Verse 9. In verse 9 it says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, guilt one another with these words. Shame people into connecting to Jesus. No. You tell the truth. Jesus is coming. We want to help you stay ready. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. But remember, they're wondering if all of this was fruitless and if only those that were alive at that time were going to be saved. But then they get the news. No. Those that have died in the Lord will be raised in the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another that it doesn't matter if you're alive or if you've died, you still belong to the Lord. I think that would have helped the that congregation. I think that would have helped them realize that life is not futile, that they can focus and finish the race, go to right to the end in faithfulness, believing that Jesus would raise them whether he came at this time or a later time. But it's a reminder to just keep going. You can't claim the victory, you won't get the crown, you don't share in the prize if you don't finish. You can't quit. You just have to finish. Diver one or diver two. As long as you compete, as long as you complete, you get the victory. It's one of the only things you get a participation award for, right? We're not in competition. We're cooperative. Because if others don't finish, that's not good. Let's work together so that we all finish. This ties into last week's themes. Let us keep going because Jesus has won the victory. He shares the crown if we don't give up because he has won everything. He has finished the race and he calls us forward. So what are the truths that we pick up in this passage? Well, here's the things that I picked up from it. We grieve the loss of those who have died before the return of the Lord, but we do not grieve without hope. Our grief is made manageable because of the hope that we have doesn't mean that grief is easy, but it does mean that it is manageable. It is, you can get through it because of the hope. We believe in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I've never seen it. I didn't see him, but I believe it. I believe it enough that it transforms all the decisions in all parts of my life. We believe that this life... Uh, that 
His life, death, burial, and resurrection provides hope for us. And so we die to our old life, have our sins washed away in immersion. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we live for Him. That's what we do. We believe enough to participate in death, burial, and resurrection, raised to a new life. Christ will return one day, and it does not matter when. Isn't that fantastic? I don't have to be alive. I don't have to know. It doesn't matter to me whether it's today or a thousand years from now or 10,000 years from now. It doesn't matter if it's in our kid's lifetime or not. It doesn't matter when if you stay faithful and if you share the news and invite others to stay faithful. It does not matter when. But I know that he will return because he said the dead in Christ will rise first. The passage tells us that. Why that's important, I'm not sure. But it would sure be neat to see. Wouldn't it? Those who are alive will rise up to be with him in the air. Meeting with the dead in Christ. All of us together. You won't be scared of heights, Dave. You won't. No flesh. No fear. That, that transformation will happen immediately. Those who are in Christ will be with him forever. No conditional salvation. You stay faithful you gain the prize, the prize is permanent. The return of Jesus is a topic of encouragement. Are there some confusions? Are there some gray areas? Are there some discussions? Sure, but the general idea is if it gets past that and it's no longer encouraging, you're not looking at it right. Can you say that? If it bothers you to, to the point that you don't know what's going on, then stop asking those questions for a while till you get back to the basics. It has to be encouraging. It is an encouragement. We do not know when he will return on purpose. So stay faithful. We're called to be alert, self-controlled, and ready. We are, not just I am. We're to be encouraging one another to this. So how do we apply these types of truths? We have the, the so what and the what now. The what now. If we're going to apply a passage like this, first thing that comes to my mind is do not be distracted. Stay alert by putting kingdom work and the development of your faith and the faith of others first. When you feel it and you see, you look at your... Uh, your calendar and your checkbook. If those are starting to show pro different priorities, you're getting distracted. Rain them both in. Kingdom work comes first. That should set everything. Encourage one another and build one another up. Help others to not get distracted. Help others to correct the course when you think they are getting distracted. And remain ready as you appreciate their effort to do the same for you. This is an open yourself to re realignment. That we have relationships with each other that says, you know, I have some concerns. Where are you at spiritually? What's going on in your life? How ready are you? Can you help me? It sure helps me when and invite others to connect. I think this, for me, consider questions related to the end times, even if, you show, even if those questions show you you don't know too much. But it's okay to look at the topic, and I think we have to because otherwise we're so focused on the here and now in this moment, we're missing the bigger point that he is coming back. And it literally could be bloop, right now, and we're gone. Like, we have to know that urgency. I think this has to be brought up in a sermon like this, in a question like it. If you're not immersed into Christ, or the other side which you warned, if you're not staying in the light, you need to consider why not. Sometimes we spend so much time convincing people they should, instead of asking people why they're not. Why haven't you made that commitment? 
If you're not, why not? And the implication of being caught that way when Jesus returns. You have a time to decide, but you don't know how long. So correct things now. Learn to value self-control as a way to serve Christ and others. The one thing that he said in this in order to stay alert, in order to stay focused, to be prepared, is he paired it with self-control. That you have to do the focusing. Nobody else can make you focused and you can't ride in on somebody else. You have to have self-control so that you don't fall asleep, that you do not fall away, that you remain as that sentry waiting to announce the victory. I find this encouraging because your faithfulness makes a difference. If we showed up today and nobody else was here, that's discouraging, isn't it? But to know that other people are going the same direction, that are putting kingdom work first, that we can work together, that we're unified in thought, that we connect on all kinds of things, that we can question why we do and how we do things, but that your faithfulness makes a difference. That's why we're here, is for each other. But let us be ready for his return. And how do you do that? No regrets. Can you say that at this point? No spiritual regrets. Nothing left undone. If he comes now, it's not I wish I had talked to or I sh should have reached out to, I should have done. But did you can say, you know, Lord, I, you found me faithful. The last words in Revelation, what does he say? Come, Lord Jesus. That we can pray that, that we can ask for that because we know that we've done what he has called us to do. Next week, we skip to another book. We're getting to the end of these in 1 John chapter 3, 18 and 4, 7, talking about that love is not just love in words. It is active. Let us be active in loving one another.